Hello, everyone. I see people are slowly but steadily joining us. We already have over 20 participants. I think there's still more people logging in, but perhaps I'm already using the time to welcome you all. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Sobeck Swan, and I'm the executive director of RARE. I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight for RARE's first conversation for conservation of the year. And I hope you all really enjoyed a very relaxing holiday break and a great start to the new year. And we are so pleased that you can join us here tonight, along with our guest speaker, Dr. Kathleen Church. Dr. Church recently completed um, a brief postdoctoral fellowship in partnership with RARE, and she investigated how pollutants like microplastics can result in, bio in behavioral changes in animals and how this ultimately affects their populations. And we very much look forward to hearing about her research and the drastic impacts of microplastics on the environment. But first, I would like to acknowledge the ter ter territory we are on. I am broadcasting from the city of Kitchener tonight, and the Rail Charitable Research Reserve acknowledges and is grateful to all of the original stewards of the land in which Rail resides, within the Haldeman Tract that is spanning six miles on either side of the Grand River from source to mouth. Understanding that this land has been rich in diverse indigenous presence since time immemorial, there are several indigenous nations that we would like to mention. We would like to honor and respect the sovereignty of both First Nations in our area, the Odenashone people of the Six Nations and the Grand River and the Anishinaabe people of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Nyawa and Miigwech to these nations who share their lands with us. We'd also like to acknowledge the neutral peoples and their ancestors and the indigenous paleo hunters who resided on these lands as long ago as almost 11,000 years. I would also like to acknowledge those indigenous peoples who currently live, work, and learn in the urban landscape around us, such as other self-identified and status First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. As an organization that is committed to reconciliation with all indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we recognize that our land acknowledgement is really only a first and a very small step in the process of healing and building better relationships with one another and with the land and waters. We will continue to honor our commitment to reconciliation by continuing to learn more about truth and settler responsibilities, working towards creation of meaningful and systemic change in relationship building that accommodates indigenous collaborators and rare to braid indigenous knowledges and worldviews. And I hope um, that before we jump into this uh, conversation here tonight, I hope everyone had a chance to watch the documentary, A Plastic Ocean, which investigates plastic waste and the pollution's environmental impact. This film was actually recommended by Dr. Church. For those of you who have not seen it and were not able to watch the film, it is still currently available on Netflix. Next, Netflix. And now I am very pleased to turn things over to uh, Rare's educator, Estefa Sufi, who is our host uh, here tonight to introduce Kathleen as our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Istifa Sufi, and my pronouns are he and him. And as Stephanie mentioned, I'm one of the educators here at RARE. Um, as an educator, I'm responsible for, for helping run the Every Child Outdoors Education Program here at RARE. And through this hands-on land-based environmental program, we offer field trips for our local schools, our summer and March break eco camps, and our nature school, and a multitude of community events throughout the year. Throughout the pandemic, we've also started offering uh, short fun activity videos that we call nature activity videos um, that you can find on YouTube and virtual field trips that can be found on our website. So we wanna acknowledge and thank both the Lilas Hallman Foundation and the Region of Waterloo for their support and funding, research collaborations and partnerships like this one at RARE, in particular in the context of ensuring that research happening at and with RARE is accessibly taught to young learners via the chain of learning. Part of Dr. Church's postdoc fellowship involved developing educational resources based on our research for RARE, including both an activity for EcoCamp as well as a virtual field trip for high school learners. We encourage teachers, parents, and all educators to check out our website for access to this and other virtual field trip content. Kathleen, was born and raised in Toronto with a lifelong interest in conservation and the natural world, especially aquatic habitats. 
After high school, she completed an undergraduate degree in marine and freshwater biology at the University of Guelph. After graduation, she then pursued a master's degree in biology at McGill, where she conducted research on invasive species in the Great Lakes, focusing on aggressive behavior between fish and crayfish. She then completed a PhD in biology at Concordia, researching fish personality, territor territoriality, and the effect of habitat complexity on behavior. She's presently a postdoctoral fellow at the Great Lakes Institute of Environmental Research in Windsor, and prior to her partnership with RARE, her research explored whether personality and hatchery raised fish is related to their metabolic rate or to their anti-predator behavior. Kathleen's current research with GLEAR and RARE uses agent-based models to, stimu to simulate a population of trout living in a stream polluted with different concentrations of microplastics that are sometimes mistaken for food. She currently lives in Montreal with her partner, toddler son, dog and cat, and enjoys reading novels and doing Pilates in her spare time. After Kathleen's talk, we'll have some time for some questions. So if you have something you'd like to ask Kathleen, please use the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Uh, you can see that at the bottom next to the chat box. And other than that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Church. Thank you. So everyone can see this okay? All right, cool. All right, so today I'll be talking about eating microplastics. So if plastic never decomposes, what happens to all the plastic waste that humans throw away? And before I begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. So I'm in Montreal, and this is on the traditional unceded territory of the Kanyan Kehaka. So an outline of what I'll be talking about. So to begin with, I'm gonna go into the background, um, some basics about plastics pollution and what microplastics are. Then I'm gonna move into talking about the research study I conducted in partnership with RARE and GLEAR, the Great Lakes Institute of Environmental Research. Then I'll move on to discussing additional effects of microplastics that we did not address in this study. Um, this includes toxic chemicals, microplastics as agents of disease, biomagnification and translocation. And then finally move into where do we go from here? So necessary changes that we need to make in society to ensure that uh, we create the future that our planet deserves. So up top, you can see plastic pollution and then bottom we have microplastics. So a lot of plastic waste is produced globally, um, huge amounts. And so this statistic is from 2016 and they found around 200 million tons of plastic waste was produced around the entire world every year. And around 11% of this ended up in aquatic ecosystems. So that's 19 or 23 million tons of plastic waste. And unfortunately, this has occurred pretty much every year since. Um, so it's from 2016, and this has even increased. So in the last few, few years with the pandemic, there's been a lot more plastic pollution um, due to um, so many disposable um, personal protective equipment. So this map here is from LitterBase. And it's a collaborative effort from um, different scientists to quantify the waste in the, oops, to go back, to quantify the waste in the world's oceans. Um, and so we know that the vast majority of this is non-biodegradable plastic. So the vast majority of these yellow dots represent plastic waste in the ocean. And then if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that it definitely has detrimental effects to animals. So here we have this bird that's covered in a plastic bag. Um, and if this doesn't cause the bird to suffocate or die quickly, um, it's gonna interfere with the bird's movement, its activities, its ability to eat um, and function, and will definitely um, end up having reduced fitness or even die um, after having this on them for a while. And unfortunately, um, due to the, the bird's anatomy, they're not able to easily um, take this plastic off. So they just get stuck and they end up permanently stuck. This can also be seen when animals get stuck in rigid plastic. So this picture here of a fish with this rigid piece of plastic around it, you can kind of see around the edges um, that he's trying to grow, but he's really restricted in that one area. And this picture is one of the least graphic of the ones I came across. You can see a lot of 
pretty disturbing videos online of turtles that have been stuck and their shells have had to grow around this hard plastic. Um, and it um, is hugely disruptive to them. So if they're um, still able to swim and feed and function, um, they're doing this a lot, uh, not as well as they could. So it's definitely interfering with their fitness and survival. Also plastic changes habitats. So here you can see all this plastic waste that's at the surface. Um, so this changes the light level. So light isn't able to penetrate into the water as deeply. Um, this affects where algae can grow and then all the different animals that consume algae. So it can um, disrupt entire food chains. As well, animals that breathe air. So um, like this dolphin or turtles or whales, they have to surface through all this plastic. And this gives them another opportunity to get stuck in plastic. And then too, you can see all these different plastic items too. They can also be used as habitat for different animals, so often small invertebrates. Um, and compared to the habitat that was there before, just open water, this can drastically change the type of animals that are available and just completely change the ecosystem. So also too, looking at um, other effects of plastic as habitats, you can see above this seahorse, um, usually they wrap their tails around um, sessile uh, plants or um, animals and they end up staying at the bottom and then that's where they, they feed and communicate with other um, seahorses. But unfortunately, this guy is wrapped around a Q-tip and this isn't stationary. So um, he's just gonna be swept all around the ocean and won't be able to perform the same functions that they would have if they had attached to something that was more natural. And then on the bottom here, we can see a crab that's in a cup. So a lot of crabs um, and species like this, so lobsters, um, they tend to be very territorial and they like small shelters in order to go in there, feel safe and then defend them. But unfor unfortunately, this guy here chose a plastic cup, which seems like a great shelter, but again, it's also mobile. So he's being swept all around the whole ocean. And the function of this cup isn't going to be as well. So you can see there's a rip in it um, that could cause injury possibly, or just change the way the water flows around it or also for other species that may use this as a nest, it could just interfere with, with all of that. So these um, habitats um, aren't usually result in um, reduced fitness for these animals. Also plastic can be um, consumed as food. So here we have a parrotfish. Um, so they tend to eat coral and then he's feeding on what seems to be um, a plastic mustard container. So the bright yellow color could serve as a signal that this is a potential food item. Um, and then um, this parrotfish will be filled with pieces, pieces of plastic and that can give them a sense of false fullness. So they feel like they're full, um, so they don't really wanna eat too much more, but they haven't taken in anything that's gonna give them nutrients. So then they end up suffering from this. And also what I find one of the saddest stories is with sea turtles. So sea turtles really like uh, to eat jellyfish. And unfortunately plastic bags resemble jellyfish a lot when they're in the ocean. Um, and sea turtles end up eating a lot of these bags. And this can result in a lot of problems for them, can interfere with their buoyancy. So they're stuck at the surface, they're unable to dive, um, can also pro cause problems with um, impaction or blockages in their gut. Um, and as a lot of sea turtle species are specialists on jellyfish, this leads to huge amounts of plastic that's consumed with super detrimental effects for them. So moving to microplastics. So as I said before, um, this, these plastic particles are unable to biodegrade. So they can't um, biodegrade, so they just become smaller. And when plastic becomes uh, within the size range of one to five millimeters, it's considered a microplastic. Um, and then from here, they still can't biodegrade and they can just become smaller and smaller. So the next category after microplastics is nanoplastics. As well, there are different types of microplastics that are specifically made to be small. Um, so the best example of this is microbeads. So microbeads um, were used in a lot of um, exfoliating products. So get a nice scrub on your skin, um, that sort of thing, and also for teeth whitening. Um, but unfortunately, this is a huge problem in terms of pollution. So they did a study um, here um, in 2015, and they found that every single day in the States, they released about 300 tennis courts filled with microplastics into the environment. So fortunately, these have since been banned, but that occurred in 2018. So this study is in 2015, and then you think three years, every single day of those three years, 300 tennis courts worth of microbeads just placed into the environment, which is huge. And unfortunately, once these beads are flushed down the sink, 
Um, they go to waste wastewater treatment plants, but they're not filtered out. So they end up going directly into um, waterways just because they're too small to be filtered out at wastewater treatment plants. So a lot of what I've presented so far refers to marine habitats. And historically, a lot of um, the research in microplastics and plastics has been in marine habitats. But unfortunately, over time, um, virtually all habitats are now affected by, micro, affected by microplastics. Um, and they're found in lakes, rivers, and ponds, a lot of fresh water. And unfortunately, this is getting worse, worse over time. And this is especially for water bodies that are in or near to cities. So we know that um, fish and other animals do consume these microplastics. Um, this can occur a few different ways. So sometimes the animals mistake um, the, the microplastic particles as something they usually like to eat and they specifically choose to eat it. They can also take it in inadvertently when they're eating other food um, or um, other animals um, tend less fish, but maybe um, other invertebrates, they tend to be indiscriminate feeders. So they just take in whatever, um, and they can end up consuming a lot of microplastics this way too. So what happens when microplastics are consumed? So this slide presents results from a meta-analysis on the effects of microplastics consumption. So a meta-analysis takes a whole bunch of little studies and combines them together in order to see what big pictures effects occur. Um, so this, in this um, study, they found that it was hugely variable across the different types of species. So it depends how the animal feeds, um, where it is in the ecosystem, where it is in the food web, um, and just a lot of species differences. But they did find that overall, the biggest effect due to microplastics is a reduced um, intake of their natural food items. So I mentioned before that when consuming um, plastics, it often gives a, a false sense of fullness. Um, and this could be what it's due to. So these, this little guy here, it's a larva, and you can see he's got um, some microbeads in his GI tract. Um, and this could lead him to feel um, full and not be motivated to um, eat anything else, even though they haven't um, taken any nutrients in. So these um, effects can be super variable across species, but I just wanted to show you a study on a specific species you could see. So this is a study that measured the effects of microplastics consumption on goldfish. So they gave them fibers um, and pellets, and they found that after a few weeks of consuming microplastics, um, these fibers were then present in their gills. So they were able to take them up through their gills as well as through their um, diet, in their GI tract, and in their excrement. So it's a bit of a positive sign that it's present in their excrement because it means that they can excrete them. Um, it's a lot worse if they get blocked, um, a lot more detrimental. However, it's not that good because these fish did suffer severe liver damage from consuming these fibers. And as well, the fish that ate the pellets, they had severe jaw damage. Um, so even though they weren't able to successfully consume the microplastics, they were still um, harmed by them. And so relative to this study, there's um, some studies that find that the effects of microplastics consumption are a lot worse. So the animals are suffering, suffering a lot more than these goldfish, or they can seem like they don't have too many effects at all. So there's a few studies where they just don't really find um, a noticeable difference um, in the health of the animals after consuming microplastics. So this brings me to the second part of my talk. So I'll be discussing the research study I conducted um, in partnership with RARE and GLEAR, the Great Lakes Institute of Environmental Research. So the working title of this study is predicting population level effects of microplastics ingestion on the behavior of stream dwelling rainbow trout using InStream 7. And the key words that capture the important parts of this study are agent based models, they're known as ABMs, stream trout, which are study animal, microplastics ingestion, which is what our study is modeling, as well as behavioral changes that occur. And we're looking at the effects on the population. So right now um, I'm working on a draft of this. So in academia, it can take a really long time for studies to get out there. But um, once this is published, I will definitely be um, letting Rare know. So if this seems like something you're interested in, please check back and it would be great to see the full paper once it's published. So we know that for freshwater salmonids, so salmon and trout living in streams and rivers, um, they do consume microplastics because they have been detected within their bodies. 
However, we don't know how this consumption is going to scale up to affect the population. And this is what our, re our research um, aims to identify. So why are behavioral changes important? Um, so changes in behavior are thought of as the first line of defense against human-induced rapid environment, environmental change. So this is known as HIREC. So it could be habitat destruction or introduction of invasive species or pollutant. And it takes um, a while for animals to adapt physiologically to stressors. And it can take a few generations for them to adapt through natural selection. But in terms of their behavior, the response is immediate. So this can tell us um, if this stress, stressor is likely to be a lot worse. So the behavior can um, make the stressor a lot worse or it can kind of mitigate the damage. So it's, it's cool to look at the behavior because it represents their immediate response. So some examples of behavioral changes that have occurred in fish that have consumed microplastics. So you can see on the left, it's a common goby. And so in a lab study with these guys, after consuming microplastics, they were less effective at foraging on their live prey. So it took them a lot longer and they were able to catch fewer prey items. And then if you look on the right, this is a zebra fish. And these guys showed hyperactive swimming um, following microplastics consumption. And as I mentioned before, that false sense of fullness could lead to um, energy deficits. And this combined with hyperactive swimming behavior could further increase their energy deficits. As well for European sea bass, um, these guys were also unable to um, swim normally after consuming microplastics. Their swimming was erratic and lethargic. And they also had lower resistance. So resistance is the, the ability to maintain your body position against um, high velocity water. And this is particularly important for salmonids because of how they forage. So they tend to um, be stationary and face upstream and then the water brings prey to them and which they then consume. So if they're unable to maintain their body position um, in um, with high velocity water, then that would severely limit the habitats that they can forage in or may um, interfere with their um, drift foraging completely. So it's definitely um, an effect that would have a significant effect on their fitness. So we're using ABMs for this study. So agent-based models, um, agent refers to um, an individual. So basically we're modeling interactions between individuals. So maybe competing for food and between individuals and the environment, such as eating food that the environment provides. And then the accumulation of all these different interactions, we can then see what happens to the population. So this is how systems dynamics emerge from these interactions. And these pictures here just illustrate some of the huge diversity of um, systems that ABMs can be used to represent. So um, anything from flight patterns of butterflies, um, cell division, growth, gossip, the stock market, it's hugely diverse. And if this seems like something that interests you, I encourage you to check out the virtual field trip that I um, developed with Rare. And we do have a microplastics agent-based model activity. So this is at the high school level, but there's some modifications you can do to make it a little bit more challenging or a little less so depending on your own um, level. And then also through that um, virtual field trip activity, you can um, access NetLogo. So it's free open source software um, where we do these agent-based models and they have a huge library of sample models, including some of these um, examples that I've mentioned here. And it's, I encourage you to check it out if it's something that you're interested in. It's I find it super interesting and I think it's super amazing how many different systems can be accurately represented here. So agent-based models are great because you can do a lot of things that wouldn't be realistic or feasible in the real world. So with the model we're using, we can do a 10-year simulation in about five hours, not something that would be possible. We can also look at different future scenarios. So in the real world, I might have to find all these replicate streams that may not be um, able to do. And then the different levels of pollution, maybe that's unethical. So I can do a lots of, a lots of things that wouldn't be possible. And I just wanna illustrate this a little further through this picture. So this is a classic um, agent-based model system. So we have grass that's consumed by sheep um, and then wolves eat the sheep. So in this example model, you can um, change the rates of growth, the um, size of the population, um, their birth rates, and you can see what happens to the population by figuring this out. And this is the kind of thing that would be extremely difficult um, 
to do with a real life population of grass and sheep and wolves. So this here is the model that we used in stream seven. Um, and you can see these cells here. So this represents a reach of a stream. And then these little burgundy triangles um, represent um, trout or um, salmon. And um, we modified this model a few ways. So first, the original model represents about 20 years of research and development um, into stream um, salmonid uh, behavior. It's used for research purposes and for management. And then uh, we were able to adapt it a little bit for our purposes. So first thing we did was we added microplastics to the environment so the fish were able to consume them. We then gave fish two different personality traits. So their dominance or subordinates, this refers to um, how strong of a competitor they are. So um, the area in which they feed. So dominants consume a lot more food because they have a bigger um, territory around them and vice versa for subordinates. We also gave them personality trait in terms of their boldness and shyness. Um, and this refers to their behavior um, in response to a predator. So shy individuals are better at hiding from predators and choose more complex habitats. While bolder individuals aren't as good and tend to be more in open habitats, um, thereby exposing themselves more to predation. And then following uh, microplastics ingestion, we um, had reductions in maximum swimming speed of these fish. So these changes that we made to the model, uh, we then had to validate to make sure that it's accurate. So this is a big topic. There can be huge talks just on this. So I'm just gonna touch on it lightly. Um, so basically what we did is we took um, information from the literature, so studies that have already been published, and um, we, we used that to inform how we made these changes, and then um, certain patterns that, were, um, that occur in real life. We ran our simulations, and we wanted to check to see if our model would recreate these patterns. So we chose a few different patterns, um, we were able to match them, and then this is how we know that our model is reproducing um, what happens in the real world accurately enough for the purposes of our study. So this brings me to our research questions. So we're interested in determining um, how microplastics consumption affects the size of a population, so the abundance, and also how it affects um, body length of these fish. And how are these impacts mediated by the concentration of microplastics in the stream? So we had either no microplastics, low, medium, or high levels. Um, also the life stage or the age of the trout. So we have fry, which are um, the fish that are just born, age zero. We have juveniles represented by age one fish and age two plus, which represents adults, as well as the personality traits that I mentioned. So whether um, they're weak or strong competitors, or if they're bold or shy with predators. So I just wanted to show you, so these are graphs that um, you can create when you're running just one simulation, just to get an idea of um, what, what's going on here. So this graph here, you can see it's for 10 years. So each of these spikes um, represents a year. So this is when the fry are born. So you can see that um, there's really, really high abundance of these guys and not as high as of the older ones. So for um, stream salmonids, the, the young are born, there's huge numbers of them and the vast majority of them die. Then if we zoom in a little bit to the adult, so you can barely see that blue line there, these are the personality traits that they have. Um, so we can see up top, the ones that are the most abundant are the dominant ones. So they're able to consume more food um, than the subordinates and those are the least abundant right here. And then here we have behavior syndrome. So this was one way we checked for patterns. Um, so certain types of um, habitats or environmental conditions will cause um, different personality traits to occur together. So here we have bold and dominance um, seems to co-occur. So these guys have the highest abundance. Um, and this happens when there's um, really high predation. And then here we have shy and subordinate ones or the lowest abundance. So this um, simulation, it was an intermediate level of microplastics with high predation and reduction in swimming speed um, after they've consumed microplastics. And then for these results here, so this differs from what I, what I just showed you. Um, so this is 40 different runs. So this is an average. Each of these um, concentrations has 10 different runs and it's the average of them. 
So you can see along the y-axis, we have the number of individuals, so the abundance. And then on the x-axis, we have the microplastics concentration. So no microplastics, low, medium, and high. And you can see that only the youngest ones are affected. So as microplastics concentration increases, um, the abundance of these fry tends to decrease. And then if we look here, this is for length. So along the y-axis, and then again, microplastics concentration along the x-axis. And it was only the oldest fish that were affected by this, the adults. You can see that in the scenario with the highest concentration of microplastics, these adults had lower length. And then we can zoom in a little bit and see what's happening in terms of their personality. So this is for um, the adult fish and then just dividing them by personality. And we can see that this reduction in length is driven by um, two um, personality traits. So down here, subordinate individuals tend to not be as long. Um, but then up here, when we look at the dominance, um, their abundance hasn't changed. And then here, this is average is also lower. Um, and that refers to individuals that um, are neither bold or shy. So the intermediate one tended to, to be lower in this environment. So to summarize, um, only the abundance of the youngest fish was affected. And this is in their super high competition stage of life. And then the older and less competitive trout, so the subordinate ones that consume less food were the ones that were shorter in length and negatively affected. So together, these suggest that individuals that are less competitive may be more likely to suffer the costs of microplastics ingestion. So luckily, our results showed that um, the behavioral changes that occurred after consuming microplastics is not likely to strongly affect uh, trout populations on its own, which is great news. However, populations that are already stressed or if individuals are already weaker competitors may be more likely to be more susceptible. So a lot of um, uh, populations of salmonids are um, not doing too well. Um, and so we know that if microplastics, in addition to all these other effects, may be detrimental for populations that are already facing habitat destruction, climate change, and disease. So this brings me to the third part of my talk. So discussing some additional microplastics effects that we didn't address in the study. So this includes um, microplastics as sources of toxic chemicals, microplastics as agents of disease, and the occurrence of biomagnification and translocation of microplastic particles. So there's two ways by which microplastics can release toxic chemicals into the environment. So the first way is through leaching. So this is when chemicals that are already part of the plastics are released into the environment. Um, and this substance is called leachate, um, and it's been found to be toxic to uh, marine life. So um, two types of larvae, uh, sea urchins and um, jellyfish larvae were negatively affected by plastics leachate. And then we also have sorption. So sorption occurs when a microplastic comes near to a toxic chemical, and that toxic chemical attaches or sorbs to the particle. And then once it comes in contact with an animal or it's consumed, um, that toxic chemical is then um, transferred to the animal. So a lot of these toxic chemicals, the research on it associated with microplastics has been done in um, marine habitats. So not a lot is known about them in freshwater. And this is why we didn't include it in our study. We don't really have the data to model it realistically at this point. Um, but these are some examples of toxic chemicals that have been found in marine habitats on microplastics. Um, and they're known to have um, significant negative effects. So some of them cause cancer, birth defects, uh, cause mutations, um, that sort of thing. So this includes polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, polychlorinated biphenyls, hydrophobic, hydrophobic organic chemicals, and known endocrine dis disruptors. Um, and so as well, um, exposure to these toxic chemicals uh, may also be expected to cause behavioral changes. But we just don't really know enough yet, but this is definitely um, something to be researched in the future. So microplastics um, can also serve as disease vectors. 
So a bacteria that's well known to cause um, disease in salmonids, um, colonies of this bacteria was found growing on microplastics in a marine habitat, um, which is not good. Um, but again, we don't really know to what extent this occurs in fresh water. Um, so we need to know a little bit more about that first before this is something that we could model realistically. And as well, I want to mention that um, microplastics that are in wastewater treatment plants um, tend to promote the growth of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this is another negative effect um, that has um, large scale implications for human health as well. As well, we can have biomagnification of microplastics. So biomagnifi ah, biomagnification occurs when um, a toxic substance increases as you go up a food chain. Um, so in marine systems, a lot of the animals that form the bottom of the food chain are indiscriminate filter feeders. So like this Daphnia here, so they just take in particles and they kind of eat whatever comes. Um, and so if biomagnification occurs, this would be hugely detrimental because um, the, the animals at the bottom of the food chain are the ones consuming the most. So there's the potential for this to really magnify up the food chain. Um, and there is evidence that microplastics can transfer up food webs. However, um, a lot of studies that looked at predators that were exposed to microplastics through their consumption of prey found that these predators um, didn't show any behavioral differences um, after this, which is good. Um, and as well, um, support for biomagnification is um, pretty weak out there in the real world. So it can occur in lab studies, but um, in real life populations, it's not really something um, that's been found to be strong. So this is why we didn't include it in the study, but definitely something to look out for. So the fact that it does occur in some lab studies, we know it's possible. We just need to know um, under what conditions um, it's likely to occur in. So a little bit more research needs to be done on biomagnification. So microplastics particles can also be translocated into different tissues. So after they're consumed, they're in the gut, and then they go into the circulatory system and can be moved around the body and then accumulate in different types of tissue. So this photo here is from a mouse, and you can see these little green dots. Um, so these microplastics were incorporated into liver tissue, into kidney tissue, and into tissue in the gut. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's the smaller fish that are the most susceptible to this. Um, as well, microplastic particles that are smaller are more likely to translocate. Um, and this is especially true for the next size category um, after microplastics, so nanoplastics, they're a lot more likely to translocate into different tissues. So what tissues um, do they like to accumulate in? So for fish, um, virtually all the studies I came across that showed um, translocation found that the liver was the main place that they um, were, were translocating to. Um, and then I think second most would be around muscle tissue. So this study here for zebrafish, they found them just in the liver, but then a study with cod and flounder found them both in the liver and in the muscle tissue. However, some species um, didn't have any evidence for translocation at all. And this includes some a study with um, rainbow trout, which is our study animal. So this is why we didn't include it in our study, just because there's evidence that it doesn't um, really occur for these guys, at least for this particular study. But a lot of species um, have even worse fates than that. So unfortunately, one species of crab, the velvet swimming crab, they found that microplastics were able to translocate into their brain. Um, and Unfortunately, once these um, particles are in tissue, they're not inert. Um, they can have neurotoxic effects, um, can um, do a lot of damage. So this is a green crab, and they found that um, these guys were able to tolerate a few translocated particles, but once a certain threshold was crossed, um, they just completely um, experienced physiological breakdown and weren't able to, to function really at all. Um, so um, combination of translocation possibly to the brain occurring for some species, as well as their negative effects on physiology, we um, can expect that translocation is also likely to cause unpredictable behavioral changes. So this brings me to the final part of my talk, 
Where do we go from here? So how do we make the necessary changes in order to create the future that our planet deserves? So from what I've presented so far, it kind of seems maybe microplastics are just an inevitable part of the food chain. Um, unfortunately, that might be the case. So in our society, it's really, really easy and really, really convenient to use plastic. Um, it is possible to avoid plastic, plastic products, but this is very inconvenient. So you um, often hear stories about people that maybe went a year or a few years um, not consuming any plastic waste, um, but you have to do a lot of things for yourself. You have to make a lot of things from scratch. And that's not always realistic or desirable for many of us. If you have a, a busy, super demanding schedule, it's not really um, something that's feasible for you. However, it's not all bad news. So um, one huge positive change that's been made in society was a recent law in Canada. So by the end of this year, um, single use plastics will be banned. Um, so this includes the six worst types. Um, so plastic bags, um, styrofoam takeout containers, plastic stir sticks, straws, cutlery, as well as the plastic six pack rings are banned. So this is definitely a necessary step that we need to take, um, but it is not sufficient. So how can we reduce plastic waste? So you have um, a fleece, and to keep warm and it's releasing the microplastic particles into the environment. You wanna eat some cookies and then you end up having all this plastic waste here. Um, you go for a drive in your car and then you're releasing microplastics to the tires. Like what can you do? Um, so in one study where they interviewed a bunch of experts on plastic pollution, they found that at this point, it's not necessarily the best bet to do large scale uh, cleanups. Um, and this is because there's just so much plastic going into the environment every single day that it's not going to make a difference. We need to cut off, uh, shut off the tap. We need to make sure that um, there's a lot less plastic going into the environment before we think of these large scale cleanups. As well, um, it is possible to work towards building a circular economy for plastics. So right now, new plastics are created from fossil fuels. They're used and then they're thrown out. So if we get rid of um, making new plastics and then we take all the plastic waste that's already there um, and just keep recycling it, keep reusing it and nothing ever gets thrown, up, thrown out, it just gets um, repurposed. That would be how we build a circular plastic economy. And even though um, I mentioned that large scale cleanups are not the best bet, um, I think at a local scale, this is really important. It can make a big difference to local habitats, um, the animals that live in those habitats. And I also think it's really important in terms of um, just having people be able to see when you throw out plastic, it doesn't really go away. It's still there to see the harm that it's doing in the environment can really help um, change our mentality towards using plastics. So the key component of a circular plastic economy would be recycling of plastics. And unfortunately, what makes plastic so great, so its versatility, also makes it really difficult to recycle. So there's a wide variety of plastics, there's different additives, and different composites, um, and many of these need to be recycled separately. So just, it's not just plastics recycling, it's like 10 different types of plastic recycling. Um, so there's three ways that you can recycle plastic. Um, right now, I think only like 1% of plastic is recycled, so not a lot. And most of this is done through uh, mechanical recycling. So this picture here is a good illustration of it. So it's high quality plastics of the same type. They're sorted, they're washed, they're shredded, they're melted down into pellets, um, and then you can create things with them. So here we have some recycled plastic Legos, and then this is a recycled plastic chair. I think it was Ikea. But that only works for the high quality ones. So low quality plastics, um, you can recycle through feedstock recycling. And that's also great for plastics that are mixed with metal. So electronics, that sort of thing. Um, and the plastic is heated in the absence of oxygen and it turns into liquid fuel. And then it can be used in the, the iron or the fuel industry. And you can also um, separate the, the metal from it as well. And then chemical recycling. This doesn't really um, occur commercially. Um, and so it's only useful for, I think, PET, but basically um, 
Plastic is made out of polymers and then the original materials are monomers. So in this, you basically turn the polymers into monomers. So kind of how they were originally and then you re um, polymerize them. So you're kind of making new plastic out of recycled plastic, but this is um, not as widely done as these other types. So I'm guessing at this point, probably a lot of you are feeling maybe a little guilty about your plastic consumption. Maybe you're like, oh, last week I had takeout twice. I had a bottle of Coke, um, feeling pretty guilty. And this is how corporations want us to feel. Um, so even if you had a perfect plastic free existence for your entire life, you never ate any, you never used straws, you never ate takeout, any of that, it's still not gonna make a dent to what um, the corporations do. So it's only 20 companies that are responsible for over half of the single use plastic waste in the entire world. It's a huge, huge, huge number. Um, this is a big problem, but it's only getting bigger. So in less than 10 years, um, this is set to double, so by 2030, and then almost triple by 2040. So this is just a big problem and we need to, to work on this one. So it seems like corporations resist change. Um, so this slide here represents um, the results of a study where they interviewed people from different fast moving consumer goods companies uh, with plastic packaging. Um, and they asked them about plastic and they found that um, these companies tended to rely on pressure from their customers for them to reduce their plastic. So this can be great if their customer base is super active and informed and really you know, informs them, lets them know. Um, but if their customer base doesn't know about this, if they're um, not motivated to, um, to let them know, then this can slow down change. Um, and although uh, virtually every single person interviewed did show a general desire for less plastic, they didn't want to be the initiators of this change. So this is unfortunate, but the good thing about it is um, they don't want to be left behind either. So once some companies start to change, the others are likely to follow. Um, but if we don't want to be begging corporations, pleading for them to change, there is another way we can do it, and this is through legislation. So legislation is a crucial agent of change and it's outside of company control. So if we go back to the new law that's coming into effect this year, we don't need to ask companies, is it okay if you don't use plastic bags? Is this okay? Say these are the laws and you have to comply. And this can be super effective um, when dealing with um, corporations that resist change. But it is possible for corporations to change. So the previous slide, they did say that they're relying on their customers to do that. And the best way um, to affect this change is through your money. So uh, which products do you buy from which companies? You can let companies know, I'm going to choose this company because they have an alternative or because of their, um, their more environmentally friendly practices, that sort of thing, and also through publicity. Um, so in this era of social media, you can call out these companies publicly um, and this will be more likely um, to motivate them to change. So yeah, money and publicity is generally um, how to affect corporate change. But if we really want to build towards a circular plastic economy, we really need a lot of um, laws to be on our side. So change the laws, change the world. And just some points of what would be important to work towards to create a circular plastic economy. Um, so one of the first things would be to increase the costs um, in a way to make it undesir undesirable for companies to create brand new plastic from um, fossil fuels. So we want that to maybe um, diminish to as much as possible, maybe even eliminate it. Um, as well, I think it's very important for um, plastic companies to have to um, clean up some of this garbage. Um, and so right now it seems that these companies are taking all the profits and the benefits of plastic and they're putting the costs onto individual people um, and to, onto the environment. And we need to change that up a little bit. Um, a lot of these corporations have the money, have the infrastructure to do um, a way, a more effective cleanup than just maybe 10 of your neighbors on a random Saturday. So we need to make sure that these companies are taking responsibility as well. We need to make sure that um, recycling infrastructure is in place for all types of plastic. So um, it will always be plastic waste if it can't be recycled. So once the infrastructure is in place, then we can make sure that all these types can be easily recycled. And then finally, we need to make sure that this recycled plastic um, is made 
a lot more attractive and a lot more valuable than uh, new plastic. So increased incentives um, to use that recycled plastic instead. So just some final thoughts. So unfortunately, um, so my talk shows that plastic waste is everywhere. Um, virtually all um, habitats um, have some, and it isn't really going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, for research, um, we definitely need more research that looks at combined effects of plastic pollution um, on ecosystems because they're all facing multiple stressors. Um, so combined with climate change, combined with disease, we need to look at how these different um, factors interact with each other and combine together. Um, and that's definitely where research needs to be headed. And also you heard here, corporations, they don't wanna be the initiators of change. So all of you can do that. Um, so you can do this through where you spend your money, what you give publicity to, um, and as well, working towards changing laws, you can contact your local representative, um, and we can be, we can do this change. So I think if you just don't wait for other people and then you take charge, we can definitely do this. Okay, and then thank you to everyone for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. And also if you think of a question later, you feel free to email me and I'll be happy to discuss. Okay, thank you. Daphne, that was wonderful. Um, and thanks again for uh, all the help with the education side of things as well. We have uh, a few questions from our audience today. Um, so we have Susan Coswin, uh, who's asking, have any studies been done on translocation and the impact of micro slash nanoplastics to human brains? In brains, like human brains? Yes. Um, I have to admit, I don't really read too many studies about humans. Um, so I know, I know it's been found for the crabs. Um, I'm not sure actually. I think I may have come, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's definitely, it's definitely something that's possible. It's definitely something that could be occurring. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of studies that address um, that for humans. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Um, Susan also commented that she thinks trying to appeal to trade associations could work as well um, and helping reduce plastic waste. Yeah, definitely. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, another question from another Susan, Susan Fuller, um, who says in 2019, the federal government said plastic ban, uh, there would be a plastic ban initiated on single use items uh, by the end of 2021. Now, due to the pandemic, they delayed it to the end of 2022. This is too slow. How do we spend up, uh, how do we speed up government initiatives? Oh God. Um, oh, I think like, it's a big, slow system. I think it's just slow. That's the nature of it. Um, also, when I was talking about microbeads, so they knew that they were hugely detrimental. Like the study came out in 2015, which means they were doing the research for it maybe 2013, 2014, and it still took to 2018 for it to, to happen. So I think um, it's just the nature of it. I don't, I don't know a lot about um, that side of the government, but I think I think that's just kind of how it, it goes. It's just extremely slow, but um, maybe a faster way instead of going through laws, like maybe if you talk to those companies directly, maybe try to call them out on social media, write letters to them, maybe the corporations could make those changes before the laws come into effect. That could be a way to get around it. But I think that's just kind of the nature of laws that they're super slow. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Marissa Roofs. Uh, how does the reduced body length in salmonids uh, impact them negatively? Um, I think maybe one thing could be it could interfere with their um, ability to, to reproduce a lot. So for females, body size is really strongly correlated with the number of eggs. Um, and so if they're not as big, they'll have fewer eggs and then that can have um, other effects. Um, and also it can just be a sign of, of poor nutrients. So um, they're not as fit, they're not able to take in the energy that they need. Um, yeah, so just together, uh, abundance and um, body length, you can see the biomass um, of the animal. So it's just less biomass. It's just another way to see like if they're, um, 
we, if the abundance isn't affected yet, it's another way to be like, okay, something's going on here. The biomass is lower. So yeah, I'd say lower fitness um, and especially for reproduction too. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, we'll give the audience uh, a few more minutes to ask any questions that they may have. Um, I've got a few for you too here, if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind. Um, could you comment on microplastic impacts within the context of the Grand River watershed? Yeah, so I came across a great study um, and it looked at microplastics in a specific species of clam in the Grand River um, watershed. And so clams are great for this because they're filter feeders. So they don't discriminate what they eat. They just kind of take everything in. Um, and they measured six different sites around the Grand River. And they found that I think virtually all of the clams had microplastics, but at much lower concentrations than they found in other freshwater systems. Um, and then for this study too, um, the sites that had a larger like catchment area, um, those were the ones that tended to have um, more microplastics, but it wasn't really um, related to how close they were to an urban center. So I think uh, microplastics are pretty much everywhere, but compared to other systems, I think um, the Grand River might be doing a little bit better. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> Do you have uh, any tips for avoiding microplastics in our own diets? Um, I think I think they're present in a lot of fish animals. Um, a lot of fish. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the species. Um, I don't know. because uh, I'm I'm like, oh, you could avoid this type, but then I don't know if the alternative might have microplastics too. Um, yeah, I think they're pretty much. They're pretty much everywhere. Um, maybe certain types of fish might be more likely to have them. And um, an obvious thing would be um, maybe avoid filter feeders, I think. So like um, clams, um, oysters, that sort of thing, because they just take in whatever's around themselves. Um, so they would be more likely to have microplastics. But yeah, I'm not really sure about the specific species of fish, because it would depend um, how it's raised and all those details. But if you have a certain type of fish you really like, maybe you can Google that and see if that's a high risk for microplastics because I think it might be pretty variable based on the conditions. But overall, I would say avoid filter feeders. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, we've got a few more here for you. Um, Quentin is asking, will the ban on single use containers include bottled water? Uh, no, bottled so water? it's just the six worst types. So it's like um, plastic bags, um, styrofoam takeout containers, plastic uh, straws, cutlery, stir sticks, and then the six pack rings. So um, it's definitely a good step, but it's, it's not nearly enough. There's still so much more plastic waste that we, we need to tackle, but it is an important first step to take. Thanks. Um, I've got uh, an anonymous question here. If it's accumulating in the livers of other creatures, uh, then maybe it's in human livers too. Uh, who would you know that might be aware of this in us? Um, the plastics, uh, could they cause liver cirrhosis as well? They could. Um, yeah, I guess my bias is always like towards fish. So <laughs> I tend to research less about humans, um, but they want to know like who they could ask to find more details about that. Um, so yeah. I, Okay, so I know that there's um, a researcher at U of T, um, Dr. Chelsea Rockman, and her um, entire lab is all about microplastics. Um, so I think she would be someone to ask. This is like her area. So she would probably know the answer to that. Awesome, thanks. Um, we've got Amy who's asking if present plastic use was transferred over to using bioplastics, would these have a similar effect to the present use of plastics? Um, have bioplastics been studied for their chemical effects on organisms? And since bioplastics are made of biological materials, would these bioplastics theoretically have nutritional value for organisms if they were consumed? Really good question. Yeah, um, this is something definitely to consider. So I don't know a lot about this, but from what I've come across, it seems that bioplastics are better, but they're not necessarily that much better. Um, so I would say probably no for nutrients. Um, and a lot of times, even if something is 
technically able to biodegrade. It doesn't mean that it will, just maybe the conditions will be off. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's better, but I don't think we have a plastic that's um, like amazing, that doesn't really have these issues. So I think, yeah, it's probably a little bit better, but not without its own issues. Uh, do you know if there's been any research done on avian predators of fish like osprey and bald eagles and how microplastics may accumulate outside of the aquatic food webs that you study? Yeah, actually, I read a great paper a few days ago. So this was in, in Florida, and they looked at, um, it was dead birds of prey that had been um, given to a, a Audubon Center or something like that, and they did dissections of all these different animals. Um, and they actually found that terrestrial birds of prey had way more microplastics than the aquatic ones, um, which, which is interesting. And then they also found, um, they had a, a bias towards the type of um, plastic. So they tend to really like fibers. Um, that was definitely the most common. And then they seem to choose um, clear and blue um, materials. So this was found overall for all the birds. But um, yeah, I guess the surprising thing was that it was so much worse in, um, in terrestrial habitats, but also too with birds is um, they can, when they pick up nesting material, um, that can also be a way for them to take in microplastics that way. And sometimes they can even um, take it in from the atmosphere, like breathe it in, which is, which is crazy too, but fish can do that in the water. So yeah, that's, that's what I found about, about birds. Thanks. Uh, do you have any tips for what we can do to avoid sending plastics and microplastics to the oceans? Um, the big thing would be um, don't use microbeads. So even though they've been banned, you might have a scrub in your bathroom um, that you haven't used in years that can have microplastics. So I would stay far away from that. Um, and though I do think it's important to be conscious of your choices, I think we really need to put the responsibility on the corporations and stop being like, oh, I, I had a straw last week, I'm a horrible person. Like, no, these corporations are the horrible ones. Um, so yeah, I think putting the responsibility on the corporations and making them take responsibility is going to be um, the biggest thing that's gonna cause a difference. But definitely in your own life, when you can like choose less plastic, but don't beat yourself up over it, and beat up the corporations. No. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, so this question is in relation to your age-based model. Um, what's one factor that you were unable to consider in your ABM that you would like to explore if you got the chance to research more? Um, so yeah, there's, um, so this would need more, um, more non-ABM studies uh, would need to be done to take the information to inform the ABM. So it would be more long-term, I guess, but, um, I think it's super interesting, um, the microbiome, um, so the, the natural bacteria that grows in animals' guts. Um, and this has been known to affect behavior. So I think there was a study with mice where they had anxious mice and calm mice. And if they put the um, microbiota of the anxious mice into the calm mice, it would make them anxious. And so um, behavior can be changed that way. So it would be interesting to look at um, the biome and then see like, how their um, microbiome is changed by plastic and then how that would change the behavior. Uh, I think that would be super cool, but that's probably a few years um, in the making before I could accurately do that. We hope you're able to do that in the future. Yeah, me too. Um, so uh, we have a few more questions still coming in. Um, is it possible that nanoplastics might form skeletal structural material or be a vitamin or a mineral in some way? Sorry, sorry, can you repeat that? I don't, I don't know if I understand that. Um, the question is asking if it's possible that nanoplastics, uh, if they could form skeletal, skeletal structural material or be a vitamin or a mineral for organisms that are consuming these uh, nanoplastics. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I do know that some plants have been known to incorporate nanoplastics into their tissue. Um, I don't know if that's harmful to them, um, but it has been known to occur. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know enough about that to make, to make an educated guess on that. Thanks for trying. That's really interesting that you can't even avoid eating um, 
animals and get away from plastics. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got uh, a few more questions here. Um, if beer companies can recycle metal cans and glass bottles, why can't bottled water companies be forced to use the same model? Yeah, I think it's more complicated to recycle plastic than for um, glass and for metal. And it's because plastic degrades each time you, you recycle it. So it's made of polymers and then um, they just get weaker and weaker and it, um, it, the quality diminishes over time. But then with glass and metal, it's, it's always good. So it's, it's a lot easier that way. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of the nature of plastic. Um, and it's also to how we treat plastic, like it's just thought of as disposable. So I think um, a lot more thought maybe needs to be into plastic recycling. Um, but I think it's definitely more steps than for um, glass. So glass, you'll just need one um, glass recycling place, but then plastic, you might need like five or seven to be able to recycle everything. So yeah, I think um, just more effort needs to be put into plastic recycling. And then maybe that could be um, something that would be easily, um, easily easy to tackle. Um, but yeah, I think as it stands right now, it's just a lot more complicated than it is for other things. And yeah, they just cleared up, the, they meant to say, uh, why can't we force them to use glass and metal instead of plastic? Um, but that's okay, I think you answer that. Uh, um, so we've got two or three questions left. Um, are there plants that accumulate microplastics better or faster than others? If you, uh, yeah, I don't actually know too much about that. So I have come across um, pictures of plants with microplastics in their tissues, but I don't, yeah, I don't know too much about what they're doing there or types of plants. I just know that it it does occur, uh, but yeah, not not much more than that. Sorry. Um. Do you know uh, the 20 companies that contribute 55% of our plastics? I assume Nestle and Coca-Cola are in there, um, but yeah. you know about any ones? I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm sure it would be pretty easy to find. Like just a quick Google search. Um, yeah, there are probably some big name companies that you, you that are well known to you. Yeah. Um, this question just says plastics in orbit. Um, I'm assuming they're asking if there are plastics in orbit around the Earth. I don't know. Um, I don't know I how they would get up there. Some... Um, I mean, it's possible. Yeah, I, I don't really know that much about them. I know that they can be present in the air. So as I said, um, some birds, birds of prey tend to fly really high um, and they can just inhale them. But yeah, I don't really know um, if they're in orbit. They they could be, but yeah, I don't I don't know about that. Sorry. No problem. So uh, last question for you here, um, and this is for any teachers that might be in the audience. Uh, would you recommend any activities or exercises for studying microplastics with students? I definitely recommend the virtual field trip um, that I worked on with with Rare. Um, it's great um, for um, just information about microplastics. We have a few activities that you can do. Um, and then maybe an activity for like younger kids would be to um, like mix a bunch of different materials together. Like if you have like dried beans, like ping pong balls, things like that. And then you mix in microplastics in that. And then um, maybe you could see how difficult it is to try to pick out the pieces of microplastics or if you um, have something that can represent an animal eating it. You can see how many microplastics it gets based on how it eats. That kind of thing could be for younger kids. But um, definitely, I highly recommend the virtual field trip that, that we developed. Awesome. Thank you very much. So that's the last of our questions. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I'm going to pass it on uh, back to Stephanie just for some final remarks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kathleen and Estefa. Kathleen, that was a really interesting presentation, very well executed too. Thank you so much for educating us here tonight about this important topic. Um, quite scary too. So I think there's a lot of food for thought uh, for us uh, about what, what we can do to take action to tackle this, this global problem. Um, if you enjoyed this event, thank you all for joining us here tonight. And if you would like to see more events like this, 
please uh, come and visit our website, uh, www.rearsides.org and consider making a donation. All donations over $20 will receive an automatically issued uh, tax receipt that will be straight sent to your inbox if you do an online donation. And I would also like to take the opportunity to take uh, to thank the team here on screen and behind the scenes. So thank you, Estefa, for being an excellent moderator tonight. And also thank you to James Bow, who is running the tech in the background, and Chris Ainsworth, who has done much of the organizing of this event, but who was unfortunately ill tonight and couldn't join us. So we hope we see you again for our next conversation for conservation, which is already scheduled to take place again on a Wednesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. We will announce the topic shortly, hopefully, but if you have any ideas or any suggestions for us for topics that you would like to see covered during these uh, lecture series, please absolutely be in touch. Uh, send an email to James, let us know, and we'll see what we can do because we're always open to new ideas, interesting speakers that we can host here. So thank you very much. And thank you again, Kathleen, for this excellent presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good night.